Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Patrice Keep, the executive director and founder of the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery. We're in the Capitola Mall. If you haven't visited, come visit. It's uh, really good for children zero to seven or eight. And um, we do this citizen science lecture in concert with the public library. We've been doing it almost four years. Had wonderful speakers, and tonight is no exception. Um, Dave Deemer is a renowned professor at UCSC, and I'm going to let him, he has an amazing bio, so I'm going to let him summarize it so I, I don't go on and on. Okay. But thank you. Sure. Well, thank you all for coming. And it's going to be fun, and I love giving this talk, and you're just the right audience for it. You know, you're you're going to learn some stuff, I think, that uh, is going to be very new to you because it's been new to me as I've gone through my career as an astrobiologist and you know, learn what that means. So, does anybody recognize what we're looking at up here? Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula. How would you know that? Mm -hmm. Have you, just from general reading or are you an astronomer? What? Seen it? Oh, yeah, sure. So, that is the Orion Nebula. The extraordinary thing is that this is what our solar system looked like about five billion years ago. We started as a cloud of dust and gas, very much as you see there. And in fact, if you look deep into this, you can see stars developing. These are all stars being given birth to by this mass of dust. And that's what we mean by stardust, because uh, you're going to get a sense of where stardust comes from now as we go through this and how it gives rise to planets like ours, and like our solar system. And then you're going to see how we think uh, a rather new idea about how life can start on a habitable planet. But one thing you've got to learn right off is that uh, uh, our planet and we sitting in this room come from the stars, very literally. And what I can do is to show you this just uh, in uh, this little uh, image of a beautiful lake and a mountain scene. You're going to see that elements, the elements of life, are made in stars. You're going to see that uh, uh, mass is still being delivered to the Earth. From our sun, we have protons and electrons. And when you see those uh, coming in, they hit the upper atmosphere, and that's the aurora borealis. So we're literally gaining mass from this material streaming away from our, our star, the sun. Now, silicon and oxygen are silicon oxide, that's the uh, sand and the quartz and the glass that we're very familiar with, and that's actually delivered uh, from the asteroid belt as meteors, and when a meteor hits the Earth, we call it a meteorite, and you can see that that's a uh, meteor track. They just happen to be lucky to catch a photographer in this. Then we have uh, more minerals that uh, make up the Earth itself. These are, again, silicate minerals. And uh, that mountain, in fact, used to be part of uh, an asteroid, used to be part of the planetesimals that gave rise to the Earth by accretion. Finally, we have water, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, and that was delivered along with the accretion of the Earth about four and a half billion years ago. That uh, date we know from uh, the fact that uranium turns into lead with a half-life of about four and a half billion years. So if you start out with one of the uranium isotopes uh, and it's pure, come back four and a half billion years later and about half of it has decayed to lead. So that's really one of the ways that we know the age of the Earth. So uh, Sagan, in fact, hello, there we go. <laughs> Can we turn off the lights? Maybe if I stand a little closer, I'll a little better control of this. There is a thing that turns us off. It's right next to the forward button. Now I have to learn how to do this. So uh, I'm sure you saw the Cosmos series many years ago, and Carl Sagan said it best. He said, we are made of stardust. And that is, so far as we can tell, true. So let's take a look at what we mean by astrobiology. I told you I'm an astrobiologist. It's a relatively new science. It started in 1996 when uh, a meteorite from Mars was analyzed. And some of you may remember this Martian meteorite that had been discovered in Antarctica. 
is called ALH 84001. is a big potato-sized chunk, and we know that it came from Mars because the gas in it is the expected gas that we would have coming to us from Mars in this meteorite. Well, uh, the people that uh, did this work thought that they were seeing fossils in this uh, meteorite, living, uh, you know, fossils of live bacteria, fossilized, not really live, but these are uh, microscopic fossils. And they claimed that in 1996, and that caught a lot of public attention, because that would suggest that life may have begun on Mars as well as the Earth, something that we still don't know for sure. But right now, I would give it about a flip of the coin, 50% chance that we're going to find life on Mars, probably in the next few years. We're going to be landing the Curiosity rover, the next version of it, and it's going to go around to some of the places that we think might have the remains of microbial life on Mars. Anyway, Daniel Golden was the uh, director of NASA, and he says, there's so much public interest. Let's get together with our little gang at NASA headquarters and invent a new science. And they invented that word, astrobiology. And that has now grown up over the next 20, 25 years to the kind of stuff that I do. So astrobiology has a definition. It's the evolutionary narrative of how stars give rise to life. Stars and astro life is the bio, so astrobiology. And uh, the way to think about this is that uh, hydrogen is a colorless, odorless gas that, when given enough time, changes into people. <laughs> and that's the truth. I'm going to try to convince you of that statement, okay? And we're going to start right away uh, by saying how much time? 13 and a half billion years, the age of the universe. So let's think about the water in our body. Our body is 70% water. That's a physiological fact. It's H2O. The H, of course, is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. That's what stars are made of, in fact. Uh, an astrobiological fact is that the hydrogen in the water is as old as the universe. It has never gotten caught up in star formation, and therefore we have inherited stuff left over from the Big Bang. Part of our body is 13.7 billion years old. <laughs> Sorry? Why not all of it? Why not all of it? Yeah. Okay. Any part of us did not come originally from the Big Bang? Absolutely. The carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in your body is younger. It's only about several billion years old. Now what we're going to do is to show you why that is. Stars make elements in a process called stellar nucleosynthesis. And some of you may have heard of, uh, of um, sorry, I'm missing a name here. Uh, yeah, Stel oh, Hoyle, Fred Hoyle. Uh, he discovered a way in which the elements of carbon are produced in a cyclic process. I'm not going to show you the details, but uh, it's now accepted that during a star uh, formation and as the star goes through its lifetime, uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are all produced by nuclear fusion, where uh, nuclei crash into each other, they stick together, and they make a new element, a heavier element. It takes a lot of heat to do that, though. 10, 100 million degrees is where you start to get this kind of fusion process. Uh, they begin to produce all these heavy elements that are now in our bodies and life on Earth. And at the end of the lifetime, a star explodes. We call that a supernova. If it's a great big star, bigger than our sun. Or like our sun, I'm going to show you some stars that have gone to the end of their lifetime because that's where that dust comes from. That's where stardust comes from. Okay, so now brace yourself because I'm going to show you a star exploding. years, I'm going to show you the remains of a supernova. 
All that's left after a supernova explodes is a little spinning uh, star called a neutron star. And you're going to hear something that you've probably never heard before in your life. You have to get the explosion again, I'm sorry. Uh, briefly, is that Fahrenheit, the 100 million degrees? That's yeah. Fahrenheit. Well, Send Kelvin, Kelvin, but there, when you get that many, it, it doesn't matter. There's just a very tiny difference. Okay, here we go to the explosion. Keep in mind that that's a time-lapse type of thing. And by the way, that's an actual explosion that was photographed, at least the uh, that expand, expanding part of it. They didn't catch the first part of it. Expansion. That's the dust being blown away from the star. It's beautiful. That was the sound of the Speaking of sound effects, I want you to take a look at this. This is another star, and it had a little explosion that made a flash of light, and you're seeing the light coming out and illuminating the dust around the star. So this is not an explosion. You're literally watching light in a time lapse going out through the dust and illuminating it. So the star that exploded is probably that one we have one more or less in the center. Now I'm going to show you the remains of another star that blew up in 1054 CE, Common Era, and that was uh, written about by Chinese astronomers at the time. A bright new star appeared in the sky, and they wrote, wrote it down, of course, because they were uh, interested in it. Uh, and what we call it now is the Crab Nebula. And here it is. This is the remains of a supernova that is now a thousand years old. Noise is an actual noise from the star. The star is rotating, and as it rotates, a radio signal sweeps past, past the Earth 30 times per second. So just imagine a star rotating 30 times a second, and if that's not amazing enough, some of them rotate over a thousand times per second, and it sounds like a, a mosquito buzzing in your ear. Yes? Big is the star that can, that's rotating that, that, like how big are they? Not very big. When they collapse, they're down to just the neutrons left. And they still have that rotation motion. Most stars actually do rotate. But, but it's not very how big are they? Yes, it's not uh, if big. I had to guess, I just have to guess that that one would be in the size maybe of the Earth, for example. But that's still big to us. Yeah. Hmm? I mean, I was wondering if you were going to say like a baseball. Oh, no, no, but no, 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 really, no, it's really These are, it's a few planetary. miles diameter. Still pretty big. A few miles diameter for a neutron star. A few miles? Yeah. Okay. So, big, big as Santa Cruz? That's all right? That's still Thank you. Next time I hear that question, I'll know the answer. Now, this is what stars look like after they've gone through. Not a supernova, but it's just the end of the lifetime of a star. So these stars have uh, collapsed. They're, they're probably several billion years old. And our sun will look like this about five billion years from now. So we don't have to worry about it yet, but that's going to be mm -hmm. our fate, the fate of our solar system. If you're the guy that first discovered these, you get to name it. And they come up with some names. And I'm going to show you some names just for fun. This is the first time you're the first audience to see these. I did this uh, just for the fun of it. So here's a robin egg, and here's the robin egg nebula. Uh -huh. Here is a seal, and uh, with a little imagination, you can sort of see a seal there. Here's an Eskimo, and you already saw the Eskimo nebula. There it comes. Here is a familiar state of ours. And there's a nebula called the State of California Nebula. There it is. And keep in mind, these are all, this is just dust, little tiny particles, smaller than bacteria, micron-sized particles. Red is hydrogen. Uh, it, Red is hydrogen atoms. Yeah, uh, it, the hydrogen will have a glow if it's uh, uh, illuminated by ultraviolet light, and then it will be 
color-coded. So the red might in fact be a color-coded gas. I'm not sure about that particular one though. That's the hydrogen alpha line. <coughs> the alpha line. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> so the comment is that hydrogen gives off a special frequency that uh, is from electrons uh, bouncing up and down around the hydrogen. And then that gives some of this light that we're seeing. You wouldn't be able to see this with the naked eye though. These are all in color enhanced. Here's another one. And you can imagine this one coming up. The Pelican Nebula. Again, yeah. use your imagination. This is uh, an easy one. And this one it is a hole. It's, but it's a heart-shaped hole. And in here, these stars, the pressure of the light is pushing the dust away and leaving this clear area with the surrounding dust. Because stars don't just get born by themselves. Very often, a lot of them get uh, born in the same nebula. This is a beautiful, watch this one. The butterfly nebula. What this is, is a star, and it's short the end of its lifetime, but it's rotating. And as a result of the rotation, the gas comes off in these two directions. And you can see that also in the next one, which is the ant nebula. Another rotating star, so that you have the stuff coming off in either direction. The uh, seagull nebula. And uh, one of my favorites is the cat's eye nebula. This is absolutely beautiful. Just imagine this gem hanging up in the sky. And we would never have seen it unless we had telescopes that are uh, able to get that kind of resolution. This is probably a public telescope photograph. <coughs> By the way, the star doesn't just explode. As it's collapsing, it uh, collapses in little phases, and each phase will <coughs> give off a circle of uh, <coughs> gas and dust, and it undergoes collapse. I and just for fun, I put that into the cat's <laughs> eyes, so uh -huh. you can see where it got its name. And those two tails, kind of the axis that's rotating around? Yeah, as I said, uh, our sun rotates, of course. Yeah. And you can see sunspots uh, rotating around the sun if you watch for a number of hours. Is that what you asked about? Yeah. Okay. So that same rotation, by the way, is left over from the rotation of the disk out of which our solar system was made. So this is one of my favorites also. It's uh, a perfect little green bubble in the sky. And right down here in the center is a star that just sort of collapsed once, and then it gave off all the stuff in this bubble. I showed that to my uh, probably three or four year old daughter, Asha, and she said, I know what that is, I know what that is, she said. I said, well, what? Which is, it's the Glinda. <laughs> so I, uh, if you remember the Wizard of Oz with Glinda coming down in that yes. bubble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very clever. What's the green? Huh? What's the source of the green? Oxygen? What is it? What? What, what, what emits the green light? Oh, um, I don't know, to tell you the truth. Uh, I can imagine it's a fluorescence, very likely, being produced by UV light from the central star hitting something out there that has a fluorescence in the green. By the way, some comets are green. Did you uh, see some of those comet pictures? There's a beautiful bright green, uh, sort of a, co a coma around it, and that's a fluorescence of a couple of carbon atoms, dicarbon as I recall. Okay, here's what a dust particle looks like. This is an actual interstellar dust, well, interplanetary dust particle. This is just all that dust that is out, and we're still accumulating it. This one was uh, picked up by a high-flying U-2 aircraft. And they had a little sticky shield that they picked up the dust particles coming in from outer space. And then you can uh, sort of see what it looks like. A bacterium would be about this big as well. This is several microns uh, across. Now that dust is important because that's the stuff that turns into planets and stars. So here is another uh, one now showing the dust, and right here you can see a star beginning to take that dust and uh, incorporate it into the fusion that is going to turn that star into a bright star. Uh, this is called the 
the Goblin Nebula. Oh. There it is, and uh, notice that I've added by Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what a uh, artist's view of a solar system looks like before it has planets forming. So you can see all of this dust now. And this is spinning around a central star. The star is illuminating it. And we know it kind of looks like that because we can actually take pictures. Here's a planetary disk uh, 450 light years away uh, taken with the Hubble. And the star uh, is giving out this sort of beam of light. It's rotating like this and the stars, it's called a T Tauri phase. And it's ejecting matter in two jets from the axis of the star. And this is the dust around it. So we go a little bit farther, we sort of see this now, planets being formed. And here's the star, here's the dust, and you can see a few planets beginning to form around there. And again, here's another uh, disk 176 uh, light years away. So we are actually seeing solar systems being formed. And just last week, there's a beautiful image, I haven't done it up, a very clear big planet around a central star. And uh, so we're just really getting closer and closer to seeing uh, what the conception or, or a real photograph. Uh, Not the Hubble inset, but, but the big, the main picture. That's the main picture is artist to uh, artist. It would be good to put such disclaimers there so that people know it's not photographed. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll try to do that. But we don't have too many more of these. Oh, am I? Okay, here is another artist view. They put together an illustration of the extrasolar planets. We are no longer alone in the universe. We now know for a fact that uh, almost every star probably has planets around it. And the way we see them is because we can see uh, the effect of the planet passing in front of the star. And the shadow of that planet sweeps across the Earth, and then we see a dimming of that light. And I'm going to show you that in the next slide. But here is, to the same scale, our sun right there. That little dot there would be what Jupiter would look like if we were way away uh, from the sun and sort of looked at our sun. That's the way Jupiter would look as it goes across. And you can see every one of these has a little spot in it. The way we can know those is that we see this sort of a thing. Here's a spot, and as the planet goes in front of the star, we see a dip in the light. And that dip, that's about four hours that it took for that thing. It's not just one dip, it's again and again and again. Then finally the astronomer will say, yes, I discovered a planet around such and such a star. Amazing. Well, I want you to know that our Earth was formed in an incredibly violent process. And in fact, our planet with our moon is a result of, of a collision between a Mars-sized planet and our Earth, when it's about 90% of uh, what we see as the Earth today, uh, this Mars-sized object came in, crashed into it, and this splash of material turned into our moon. Mm -hmm. So we can make a computer model of that, in fact, and this is what it looks like. Here's two uh, objects coming together. Let's see if uh, one goes from here to here to here to here to here. And this ejected material is what uh, became our moon. Yes? So what you're talking about when, there, when new solar systems are being formed in other planets, so are you saying that it take, I forget how many, but three and a half, or however many billions of years before life will be formed because the elements are coming out that could create, if it's carbon-based life? Uh, so the question is, how long did it take before we think that life got started yeah. on the Earth? Not as long as that. The Earth is 4.5 billion years old. We know that from uranium lead dating. Uh, the first fossils of life in the Pilbara region of Australia, where I was visiting just a couple years ago, is are three and a half billion years old. And that was microbial life more or less as we know it. So we think life probably started up a little bit after the uh, ocean condensed from the water vapor in the atmosphere, and that gave life a start. And uh, toward the end of my talk, you're going to see our ideas that we are developing for how life came to be on the Earth.
That's the biology part of astrobiology. So this is what we think the moon and the earth look like. We're standing on the earth. Uh, it was red hot lava temperatures uh, at the, shortly after this collision occurred. The moon was red hot as it was accreting from all the stuff that was blown away on the surface of the earth. And if we could see the moon about that time, we would see large planetesimals, bigger actually than the dinosaur killer 65 million years ago, hitting the moon and leaving pools of molten lava that the artist has shown you here. So that, of course, is an artist thing, but the next one is not. So next time you look at the moon, realize that these are former lava oceans that have now uh, cooled off and uh, become the familiar face in the moon. You can also see a couple of big meteorite strikes. These are uh, probably hundreds of miles across Tycho and Copernicus, these uh, giant craters that we've been able to see with telescope for centuries, actually. So that's our moon. That's really quite a, uh, quite a new version of where uh, the Earth-Moon system came from. Point to make out here, though, the far side of the moon doesn't have those pretty Marius and the right. craters. It's very heavily cratered. And of course, you know, but maybe other people here don't, that the moon keeps its same face toward the Earth. That's called a gravitational locking, uh, the sort of tidal energy that the moon and the Earth exert on each other slows it down until finally it becomes tidally locked and always faces the same way. Yes? Um, what sort of evidence is there that our Earth-Moon system came from that collision that you mentioned? How yeah. do we know that? Uh, there's a number of ways we know that. It's a wonderful question. Uh, one is mathematical. You can model this in a number of ways, and this is the most plausible way mathematically for the Earth and the Moon to have formed. You know, you can it's very hard to just accidentally get something the size of the Moon in an orbit. You've got to lose a lot of energy in a collisional process, so that's one. Then, given that, the minerals on the Moon should look like the minerals on the Earth's surface, and they do. That's, that's probably some of the strongest evidence, is the mineralogy of the lunar surface and the Earth's surface. So I want to tell you a bit about uh, these big things that uh, hit the moon back then. And uh, this is a comet called uh, Temple, Temple One. And that's just the nucleus of a comet. This came by, and we were able to get a spacecraft into orbit around it, got some pictures. So that's really what the uh, comet hit, the nucleus looks like. And then, of course, the tail is all the steam and uh, dust and other material being blown away from the comet. Now, to give you an idea of the size of this, what I did in the next slide is to take the city of New York and put it onto the comet. And suddenly you say, that's how big a comet is. It's, you know, maybe 10, 20 miles across the typical cometary nucleus. So there's New York floating around in space. So, what's in a comet? Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. You wonder where the organic compounds came from to make life on Earth possible. And one place, one possible place, is comets. Another, you're going to see, is that dust particles I told you about. Some asteroids, maybe, some meteorites, and so forth. All of that stuff gave us some uh, material. When we look at a comet, and that's a real comet that uh, we've uh, uh, flown around. In fact, this is the one that they, the Rosetta mission tried to land a little lander on, if you remember. Uh, anyway, we have uh, a composition now. It's about 6% ice. 30% dust particles and 10% carbon compounds. And this dust, by the way, comes off when a comet goes by uh, the Earth and goes around the Sun. It's exuding these little dust particles. And when you go out to see a meteor shower, like the Perseids, for example, we're flying through a dust trail from one of the comets that came by. So it's uh, really quite interesting that uh, we, that's another way for stuff to get delivered to the Earth. Now that organic carbon is really interesting as well because this is what we need to get life started. So look, this is some of the stuff that's in a comet. We make water, 100, just for scale. 10% of it's carbon dioxide, 5% of it's carbon monoxide, methanol, methane, formaldehyde, 
formic acid, acetic acid, HCN, ammonia, and H2S. So that is the composition of a comet. And you could smell a comet. You would smell this stuff. This is that rotten egg smell that you get when you go to uh, areas with uh, some volcanic uh, activity. That's so, say hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide, yeah, that's, that's, HCM. that's HCM right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that we know from Stanley Miller's work that if you mix this with this from all the height, you get amino acids. Oh, wow. That's a very important so part of the chemistry uh, leading up to life, that we can make amino acids, and you're going to see that when we analyze meteorites, amino acids are there, made oh. without any life at all, just chemical reactions. So here's just summing up what I told you. Uh, the solar system is made of a uh, molecular cloud with uh, particles, mineral particles. These accrete into comets and a planetary dust particles and planetesimals. The organic compounds come along with that accretion process. And then after the Earth is formed in what we call late accretionary infall, and that's between about 4.4 maybe 3.8, we have this sort of tailing off of uh, infall. Uh, you have a lot of organic material delivered to the early Earth. And that organic material is produced from this ice layer. There's a little thin layer of ice around it. And that contains water, methanol, carbon monoxide, and ammonia. And that's the stuff that is made. Now, here's a word that you're going to want you to keep track of. Amphiphiles. Amphiphilic molecules is something I've been studying for 50 years. An amphiphile is a oily molecule with a little acid group or an alcohol of some so-called hydrophilic group at the end. I'm going to show you amphiphiles. They're very important because amphiphiles self-assemble into membranes. All of our cells are surrounded by a membrane composed of amphiphiles. If that's true, if life requires membranes, then the First life also required membranes. And that is something new that we have been bringing out to uh, anybody who cares to listen, like you. So you're going to be hearing about that. Um, what's some HMT? Yeah. What's HMT? HMT is a special um, hydroxy methyl T, something I forget what it is, that's sort of an intermediate between um, the nitrogen coming together with a methyl group to make this uh, unstable compound that then goes on to make uh, amino acids. Yeah? Uh, that's a uh, kind of strange cigar-shaped object that passed through our solar system yeah. a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. what, was there any analysis done? Were we able to determine its composition? Apparently it came from outside the solar system. Yeah. So it, is it similar to the bodies floating around in our solar system? I haven't heard that there has been speculation, really. It would be speculation because that just came through and it went and we just accidentally almost found the thing because we're looking for asteroids and here's this long cigar-shaped object coming from nowhere, you know. It's uh, not part of the rotation of uh, all of our other stuff. So it just passed through and we didn't have time. It just came plus or minus a week or so that we could see it visually. So I don't have a good answer for you on that. Okay, looking back in time now, this is the time when life began. This is the primitive Earth, uh, prebiotic Earth, we call it. There is a nitrogen atmosphere, just like today, but no oxygen. Photosynthesis hadn't started up yet, so there's no oxygen. Uh, there are volcanic land masses, just like today, uh, with a lot of heat energy. There was an ocean, of course, about four billion years ago, with we're certain from the mineralogical records that there was a salty ocean. And also, because the land mass has risen above the ocean, there is a distillation of water from a salty ocean to make uh, what we call the custrine environments. These are distilled water. And if you think of places like Yellowstone, with all those boiling pools, that is a environment, we call that hydrothermal field. That is very important because there is now a controversy. We're right in the middle of it. Did life begin in the ocean or, as we think is more plausible, 
then like begin in freshwater hydrothermal fields. So I'm going to bring that up time and again because, and I'm going to give you the evidence that we've accumulated saying that it's implausible that life began in the ocean as we've always thought. It's more plausible, we think, uh, for a number of reasons that life began in freshwater. So that's going to be the, toward the end of my talk. So what organic compounds do we need to start up cellular life? Well, one thing we need is what are called monomers. When I look out and you see you, you're all alive, uh, I see polymers. You were made, what I see is amino acids that make up the skin proteins, the keratin, the keratin of hair and so forth. That's our skin surface. That's one of many thousands of proteins that we make, okay? So, but it is a polymer made of amino acids. And a lot of our body, in fact, is composed of amino acids that have been polymerized into thousands of proteins, thousands of different proteins. So we need monomers. We also need what are called nucleobases. And you may know that in DNA there's four nucleobases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And in ribonucleic acid, there's also four nucleobases, adenine, guanine, um, cytosine, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. DNA has those four, but DNA has thymine as the fourth, uh, RNA as uracil as the fourth. So those are what the nucleobases are. And they are attached to a carbohydrate, either these typically are ribose, and then the carbohydrate is attached to a phosphate. So we need to find some way to make those. We also need to have amphiphiles. These are these self-assembling soap-like molecules, and that's where we've made a lot of progress in understanding where the amphiphiles come from. So we think that the amphiphiles are produced as a photochemical process in the early solar system. They gather together into what we call planetesimals or asteroids now. This is the asteroid called Eros. And if you look at asteroids, they all have impact craters. And those impacts are small asteroids hitting big ones we actually watched this happen once. It's only been one time that we photographed this. Somebody was taking a picture of the asteroid belt and they saw this extraordinary thing. They thought it was a comet at first. Then they looked down there and there's a little tiny point that uh, is definitely not a comet. And it turns out that all of that stuff trailing behind are potential meteorites. Those are pieces of the asteroid. And if they come to Earth and we pick them up, and we do, of course, then we call it a meteorite. So what I'm going to talk about now is some of the meteorites that I've been studying because we want to know what organic compounds are in meteorites. So this is a field in Murchison, Australia in 1969, September 1969. Uh, the townspeople were startled when a bright light appeared in the sky and a bolide came across and exploded. And about a minute later, there's this thunder from this explosion. And all around the little town of Murchison, wherever those red dots are, as you can see, a chunk of this meteorite fell. These were about 100 kilograms of total meteoritic material. This is the best studied meteorite because it was picked up immediately. Scientists raced there to pick it up. And the townspeople picked it up and was selling it to the scientists and so forth and so on. So uh, that now is in museums all over the world, some of which is made available to people like me. So here's one of the ones that has come through my lab. This, we call this the Murchison meteorite after the town that it fell on. Now you can still see the fusion crust is still traveling pretty fast when it exploded. And so the friction of the air uh, melted the surface. But the interior stays at the temperature of outer space just this insulated from all that heat on the surface. When we break it open and analyze the organics, it's quite extraordinary that over 1% of this material is a carbon compound called kerogen. And if you look at a piece of coal, that's kerogen. Kero just has to do with kerosene, kerogen. So that is a polymer of material we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon compounds. So 1.5% of the mass about 0.1%, this red part, is soluble organics. And look, this is a veritable organic chemistry laboratory of stuff. 
It's got carboxylic acids, which are important, and you're going to see why in just a moment. That includes things like acetic acid, the acid of vinegar. It's got dicarboxylic on it, got amino acids, amides, aliphatic hydrocarbons, this is oily stuff, aromatic hydrocarbons, aldehydes, alcohols, amines, and right there, one part per million is purines. So one of the nuclear bases was found in the Murchison meteorite. So this is the stuff that we need to find some way to get them to self-assemble into living cells. That's our starting material. Okay, self-assembly. Everybody's blown soap bubbles, and that means that everybody has made membranes. This is the stuff that makes membranes. Soap is amplifiers, and it holds together, not because it sticks together chemically, but for physical reasons. I, I won't go into that unless you really understood. Uh, but soap bubbles are pretty amazing. Uh, they are unpredictable. Nobody yet could predict that a soap bubble will occur if you blow some air through a bubble solution. You know about it in hindsight, but there's no physical law that says soap bubbles must form. So it's one of the most interesting emergent phenomena we talk about, that uh, we know it happens, but we don't know quite why it happens. So that's a self-assembly, and soap bubbles are made of soap, fatty acids. You're going to see what a fatty acid looks like in a little bit. This is a picture I took in 1985, published it uh, uh, in that same year. What I did was to take that Murchison meteorite I showed you and extract it to see if there's anything soapy in it. And yes, there was. Nobody had thought of doing that before, but there are material in it, compounds, amplophilic compounds, that can form membranes. So we were able then to state that uh, on the early year, there's a good chance that there was amphiphilic compounds available to make membranes, such as you see here. There's all stuff right out of the meteorite. We know there are membranes because we didn't encapsulate a fluorescent dye inside. They're definite inside and outside. So uh, we, we know about that. So given that, that really leads us on uh, to thinking about how life can come to be. There's three things that have to get together by self-assembly uh, to make up something that might become a living system. You've got to have a nucleic acid, you've got to have proteins or peptides, you have to have lipids to make those membranes. So what I'm going to do now for you is to show you the research we've been doing in which we take, we are able to synthesize uh, a polymer called ribonucleic acid and capture it inside vesicles as a step toward life. That's called a protocell, not a life, but it's a step toward life. So that's really the last part of my talk here. This is what lipids look like. This is a fatty acid. This particular one has probably 16 carbons in it, just nothing but CH2, 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 and so forth. And there's the acid group. It's called a carboxylate group. That's why it's called a carboxylic acid. It's an acid because that little proton, that white thing, can come off and uh, acids are defined by the ability to release protons or hydrogens into solution, okay? These are the lipids that we make enzymatically. This is what makes up our membranes. So we think that there will be a progression with evolution from very simple membranes to more complex membranes. This is a phospholipid and this is cholesterol, in fact. And every cell in your body, in fact, is composed of those two kinds of lipids, phospholipid and cholesterol. So, uh, when we go back to the early Earth, we imagine things like this happening. This is self-assembly of phospholipid. what a membrane looks like. 
it is a lipid bilayer. Here is one layer of a phospholipid. Here is the other layer. And this is as essential life for life as DNA and proteins. In the absence of structures like that, life could not exist. You have to have a membranous container for life. Otherwise, everything just goes away, right? So that's, that's a point that we've been making, that the first form of life also needed uh, some sort of a container to help it keep all its systems of molecules together. Well, we can now ask another one, another question. I showed you self-assembly in the laboratory. Can self-assembly occur in a prebiotic condition? I mean, this salt water, volcanic activity, no oxygen. And yet, I'm going to show you our, the way we tested this. So I've been to Kamchatka twice to visit the volcanoes there. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, high altitude, high latitude, a very recent volcanism. It's a sterile site for the kind of analysis we're doing. So what I'm asking in one of these trips is, can we get self-assembly to occur in a volcanic region like Kamchatka? So Kamchatka, by the way, is a peninsula coming down off of eastern Russia. Uh, Japan is down here. Okay. Um, Anchorage, Alaska is up here. This is what uh, Sarah Palin said out her window. You may remember. <laughs> uh, so what we do is we fly up to Anchorage, just a few hours up to Anchorage. Then next morning we hop on a plane. We land in Petropavlovsk. And that sounds very Russian, but it's just the Russian words for Peter and Paul, Petropavlovsk. So uh, the guy that discovered that day, he had two ships, one named St. Peter and one named uh, Paul. So he, that's how it got its name. We then hop on a Russian troop carrier that we rent and drive down to Mount Matnovsky. And that's about a day's drive. And this is an active volcano that uh, erupts every few years. So we went to a, uh, uh, a volcano to do this work. So there's, uh, I think this is, our, yeah, this is our second group that we took along. Uh, this is Chan. He was a postdoc at the Carnegie Institution. This is Jake. He was also a postdoc there. This is Jamie Elsila. She's a PhD student at Stanford at, with Dick Zare, and she's now a comet researcher at Goddard Space Flight Center. This is uh, Vladimir Kompanichenko. He's my local organizer, very nice guy, and he took care of all the details that I could not do uh, at such long distance. This is Melissa. This is Igor. There really are Russian name Igor that uh, guide us to where we want to go in the volcano. And this is Tony Hoffman. Some of you might know Tony. He's my neighbor just down the way up in Bonnie Dune area. He came along uh, just uh, to be our photographer. So the pictures you're going to take, you're going to see, are taken by Tony. So here we are climbing up the slope. It's about a half a day climb. We're climbing over a small glacier to get up to the volcanic crater. That's uh, Jan and Jake. And here's Vladimir now looking down into the crater. So when I think of the early Earth, this is what I imagine. Nothing alive, lots of uh, minerals, lots of water, lots of volcanism, and we're going to find our way down to the bottom of that crater to do the experiments I'm going to show you. So here I am now taking a sample from one of these funerals. Uh, that white stuff coming out is mostly steam, but it's also hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, sulfurous acid, so often enough when that wind blew the steam towards us, we had a gas mask that we had put on to protect our lungs. So I took a sample, and uh, there's Vladimir helping me. We're going to take this back to my lab and see what we can find in it in the way of organic material. Uh, we also sort of covered my bet. I didn't know for a fact that we would find enough organic material to do the kind of experiments, so I took some along. We found a little puddle, we call this Darwin's hot, hot little puddle, after the Darwin's warm little pond that he proposed where life began. And what we're going to do is to use this little puddle, which is about this big, boiling in the center. We're going to use, we're going to do an experiment with that. We're going to pour in a prebiotic soup. And in that soup is amino acids, four amino acids, four nucleobases, AUGMC, amphiphilic molecule of fatty acid, glycerol phosphate, P3, 
pH 3 as well as the pH, the acidity of lemon juice. And we're just going to see what happens over a period of minutes to hours per day. So we take samples to take back to the lab. But we can see something happening right away. Within minutes, what we saw is a white material all around the edge of this. And that white material were self-assembled amphiphilic structures, little cells. So self-assembly does occur in a natural organic setting. And I think that's a very nice place to uh, do some experiments in the laboratory. So we're simulating just what I showed you here back in the lab to see what we can find out about, about this. So hydrothermal systems are conducive to self-assembly, lacustrine environments, but not to the ocean. None of what I showed you could happen in seawater. Seawater has calcium, magnesium, it's hard water. It precipitates soaps rather than letting them form membranes. That's why hard water doesn't work if you're trying to wash your hands, right? It's the calcium magnesium in it. So uh, what we're going to do now is to see if we can guess how to make that little system come alive, or at least a step toward life. So I've got to show you one thing that you won't know otherwise. And that is that when we dry things out, so those little ponds are going through continuous cycles of wetting and drying. When we dry things out, such as these little vesicles, these are lipid vesicles, they're microscopic. This might be DNA or it might be some uh, nutrient or whatever. When we dry it, they fuse and they capture the material between the layers. Then when we rehydrate, we get the vesicles back, but now we've got stuff inside. That is how we think that the first encapsulated systems of polymers could have come about on the early Earth. Just wetting and drying cycles uh, in places like these hydrothermal fields. So uh, we know that this works because we can do it in the lab. This is just fatty acid, decanoic acid, 10 carbon fatty acid. Put it through one wet dry with some DNA present and all the DNA is treated with a dye to make it highly fluorescent. And you can see that we've made simple little cells. We got a nucleic acid in a lipid membrane just by one wet dry cycle. So this is where we're going. But there's something else that happens in wet dry. And that is that if you have monomers going through the wet dry process, they turn into polymers. That is new. We've been publishing that now for several years and slowly penetrating people that we might know how to make nucleic acids without anything alive. It might be a self-assembly process driven by this wet dry cycling that we see in hydrothermal fields. This is what we imagine it looked like four billion years ago. Geysers. The artist made little droplets on the camera lens. There's an animation, by the way. This isn't real, although it looks real. So the geyser flushes water down little streams. That brown stuff on the top is uh, amphiphilic molecules floating on the surface. The stream goes down through uh, a volcanic field. And we see that kind of field all over the world. Every volcanic area we have. Visit. This looks like uh, Yellowstone, in fact. And as that geyser adds water, uh, the water goes up and down on rock surfaces like this. And what we think is that that wet dry action right there is where we have this wet dry cycle that we're trying to tell you about. So here's what our scenario for the origin of life is. And this is new. Nobody's really followed this up yet before. So we have hydration, dehydration cycles. We know that uh, polymers like RNA can be made under those conditions. The lipids encapsulate the polymers. I just showed you that. It's easy, just wet dry, and you can uh, get encapsulation. Every one is different. Each of the little microscopic protocells is different from all the rest. And that means that selection and evolution can occur. So toward the end of my talk, you're going to see that, see the little image uh, demonstrating that. Each little protocell is a natural experiment I'm trying to figure out you know, how can I uh, stabilize myself, how can I survive. So here now we're just going to go over the last few slides. We think life began not in the ocean but in areas where fresh water 
has evaporated from the ocean and fallen on volcanic land masses. Uh, that's what we think the Earth looked like back then. There were uh, geysers coming up. There were hot springs bubbling. That's just what we see today. Uh, that water then is going through wet-dry cycles. And uh, the wet-dry then, by the way, this is Bumpus Hill. Has anybody here been to Bumpus Hill on Mount Lassen? I thought you might be. It's an amazing place, isn't it? That's our field site. So we are doing experiments in the laboratory, but we're also doing experiments in places like Bumpus Hill. There's a volcanic outbreak on Mount Lassen. Highly recommend it. It's easy walk, maybe half an hour to get to it. So here's, here's our uh, wet dry happening on the edge. It's kind of like a bathtub ring going through the wet dry cycle. And here's what happens now in a cartoon of what we think occurs. Here are the lipids floating around. They're just soap molecules as in a solution with a mineral surface. As it evaporates, they get more and more concentrated. These now are monomers of, uh, for instance, amino acids or nucleotides. As the drying occurs, films are produced, and these films then concentrate the lipid and the uh, monomers in such a way that the monomers begin to polymerize. So you can see single monomers here, and you can see these little strings that indicates this polymerization. And again, we do this in the laboratory. We know that this works. So uh, this, by the way, is a microscopic image. So when I drew this, I had this in mind. This is uh, a lipid multilayer with stuff captured between the layers. So then it gets rehydrated, and all of those little vesicles uh, bud off of those multilayer lipids, and they carry with them these polymers out into solution. Some of those polymers might, in fact, help the vesicles to survive. And as they get out into the larger world, we see that some of them break up, they get dispersed and recycled, but some of them have polymers that stabilize it. So in my opinion, this is the first step in evolution away from proto-life toward life. It's this just survival of the stresses that these encapsulated polymers go through. So this is uh, the big picture that shows what I've shown you now. Here is the hydrated state with all of those uh, little captured polymers. Here is a moist gel phase where they can kind of exchange the polymers with each other. And here's the dry phase where the polymers are synthesized. And this cycle goes around and around and around for millions of years. I mean, we're not talking about you know, uh, a weekend in the laboratory. We're talking about long time periods. And while that happens, uh, these things get progressively more complex and finally take on the uh, properties of life. So once more hydration phase, a hydrated gel phase, and finally this anhydrous phase where the polymerization occurs. So we got brave enough to put this in the Scientific American. And just yesterday, this arrived in Safeway. I was able to go down and buy uh, uh, a Scientific American article. And in the uh, Scientific American, uh, it shows the version that the Scientific American artist did, just what I told you. So this is everything I told you in a nutshell, plus a little bit more. You've got organic materials synthesized. They are delivered to the earth. They accumulate and get concentrated in pools on hydrothermal uh, fields of volcanic areas. Uh, they come down here, and in these pools, these things are evaporating and rehydrating, and we have this cycle. They show it as a kind of a spiral starting here and going around and around and around. And then finally, now we haven't talked about this, finally they learn how to capture light energy. And that is a very important step because you know, there's not a lot of nutrient chemical energy around the Earth, but there's lots of light. So we think that photosynthesis started pretty quickly. Uh, and then the artist shows he's turning green. Finally, they get to the ocean. And that is totally opposite to the paradigm that life mm -hmm. began in the ocean and climbed up yeah. onto land masses yeah. uh, billions of years later. So it's an alternative. You know, We don't know if it's right or not, but we're challenging the ocean guys to show us experiments showing that their, their idea works. 
and we're showing them that our idea works and we're just kind of having this interesting controversy in the literature. Well, that's all I have to tell you. In the next few years, I think somebody will be able to put together a artificial life in the laboratory. But uh, we still won't know how life did begin because that was four billion years ago. I think we will know how life can begin on the early Earth and other habitable planets. So that's what I have wow. to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> the question, will, will life continue to, to go on? Continue to evolve? Yeah, it can, well, continue to change because of the current condition of many of the individuals. I think that uh, we are still evolving. In fact, this question comes up. Are humans still evolving? And there is uh, evidence that in small ways at the molecular level, there are changes. Uh, so a Sherpa will have a slightly different set of genes that lets them live uh, at 10,000 feet and higher. Uh, whereas uh, we have another set of genes having to do with the way our blood carries oxygen. So there's small uh, incremental changes that give ourselves a million years and we get all the way from our primate ancestors in Africa to where we are today. And that took a million years. Yeah, I was just referring more to the toxicity that the environment is experiencing in terms of the you know, life forms that are no longer able. So I think you're talking about the Anthropocene era. Have you heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have the Holocene has been where we have been living, but we're having such a big effect on the Earth and it's right. it happens that we're now talking about the Anthropocene. Yeah. So that we are, uh, there's a really interesting uh, thing I just heard. When you add up human beings and their domestic animals, all the cattle and sheep and pigs we raise, that's 95% of all the mammalian life on Earth. Only 5% is left over for life in the wild. So that is how we have taken over the Earth as a successful um, species. Is that by weight or by head count? Uh, by no. biomass, so that would be by weight. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes? Uh, from those um, the self-enclosed uh, membrane, lipid membranes, you kind of finished your story just yeah. about that point. How big a leap is it from that stage to the earliest forms of, of cellular life that we know, once, yeah. one cell? Uh, we have not filled that gap yet. I've taken you up to that gap, and now we're looking into a vacuum of knowledge. We don't know how the genetic code arose, for example. We don't know how ribosomes arose to, the, to, tra to translate the genetic code into protein. We don't know how uh, the energy became available through light. Somehow photosynthesis started, but we don't know even, even that. That's pretty simple. So there's a huge gap uh, to be filled in before I could answer your question. I can kind of show you that gap. So I can uh, at least uh, tell you things that we kind of are leads into that. For instance, photosynthesis. It couldn't have been chlorophyll. You know, that's all that green stuff out there is chlorophyll. Couldn't have been chlorophyll because chlorophyll is made by enzymes. So what pigment might have captured light energy? Well, we have proposed that those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are one of the most abundant molecules in the universe, because these are just little rings of carbon, they absorb near UV light energy, and they can do what chlorophyll can do. They can deliver electrons to an acceptor. They can make proton gradients if you treat them right. They can capture carbon dioxide by a photochemical process. So I think, just for example, that's where uh, one idea is. But what happens then is that I have to interest a student. The student has to come to me and say, I really want to work on photosynthesis. I say, oh boy, I've got an idea for you. And then I have to go to NASA. I say, NASA, give me $200,000, please, so I can support this student for four or five years. See, there's a lot of kind of friction uh, that is, uh, works against uh, people in this field, because this is not a very well-populated field. So w w would there have been some production of oxygen before um, chlorophyll was? There is, a, there is a photochemical way to make oxygen that involves iron in solution. 
So you can get a little bit of photolysis of water, but uh, it's really minute. Uh, I think that the photosynthesis explains most of what we uh, call talk about uh, oxygen. Yes? I used to hang out with children a lot. And one of the discussions was about what they were going to be when they grew up. Mm -hmm. And about being interested in a lot of different things, but not being able to see them coming together. If your fifth, you told your fifth grade teacher that you were going to be an astrobiologist, mm -hmm. what would she have said? Uh -huh. I mean, to me back then? Yes, yes. Uh, well, they were saying, uh, I'll bet you're going to do a good job in science. So I was passing, I was going getting science fairs and all that stuff in my uh, early teens. I, have, I still have my butterfly collection. I got a blue ribbon that's sort of up in the closet someplace. So I had an interest. I think that uh, an interest in science is like an interest in music. Only one in a thousand Americans make a living doing what I do. There's four, about 370 million Americans, and there's uh, about 350,000 scientists. That's one in a thousand, right? So it's a rare thing, and it's like having a musical talent or a musical curiosity. A scientific mind simply is curious, endlessly curious about the world around us, and it shows up in a rare kid. Uh, you know, my kids went to Bonnie Doon Elementary, and I can remember one kid, I said, this kid is probably going to go into science. The rest, of course, are just going to do other things as human beings do. So, I don't know if I answer yeah, that yeah, it, 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 It's just that sometimes I think that, that as adults, we put barriers up about because it doesn't exist, it can't yeah. exist. Yeah. And, and that, that sense about the wonder of, of perhaps something, something more is... Yeah. Uh, it's an important thing. You know, curiosity is the only thing that gets me out of bed at this point in my life. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, and I think that's that being able to, to know that there are things that exist that operate basically from the motivation of curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see, I have a question here. Yes, but did, when you were talking about how matter is still coming into mm -hmm. our planet and other planets, and then I've heard that there's only a certain amount of water on the planet, and so, but it sounds like from what you're talking about that hydrogen and oxygen could be coming in and more water could be created? Is, is that true? Yeah, the protons delivered to the upper atmosphere by the sun uh, probably do pick up electrons and turn into water. Because, you know, that's really what protons do. Uh, <coughs> but it's such a minuscule amount. It's just a uh, uh, Mars had water, but Mars water evaporated over periods of many millions of years. So Mars did not have enough gravity to keep water molecules in within its uh, atmosphere. So it just lost it. Yes? Oh, um, synthetic biology. Uh, Craig Bettner. Yeah. Um, does he do anything like what you were doing? He's interested in this. Uh, he's, uh, of course, a technological marvel. So he did, in fact, put together a bacterial genome. 500,000 bases long. He took that synthetic DNA that they had made. It's not Craig, it's all the people at his institute, you know. So he took that and put it into a new bacteria that had been enucleated, you know, I have no DNA, and that thing came to life. So he has put together partly using previously generated genetic information. He's been able to transfer through a synthetic process. What we're trying to do is another another kind of a uh, approach to that. In fact, I gave a talk uh, at the Stanford Linear Accelerator a few months about this. They were celebrating Frankenstein. This is the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein's uh, publication of Frankenstein by Mary uh, Bliss Shelley. So uh, the point is that uh, we're sort of doing a miniature version of that. We're trying to take apart a bacterial cell. We're using a wet and dry process to take all of these cytosolic components and trap them in a lipid membrane. And we got one gene to work as a gene that makes a fluorescent protein. So we know that we're one step toward reassembling life from a completely disorganized system. But uh, we have 5,000 genes to go to make a live bacteria. So that, that's about where we are with synthetic biology, at least in my lab. Amazing. Yes. 
Um, do you want to talk about your books and if people want to know more on different levels? Oh, yeah. So uh, I have one book written at a kind of a language for scientific American readers. It's uh, for people that just are curious about science. It's written in a language that most people don't understand. It's called First Life. And that is uh, through University of California Press, published in 2011, and 15 bucks <coughs> on Amazon for a paperback copy of it. Also on Kindle. I've got a little Kindle version of it. Now, <laughs> now, a new book is coming out in October, which uh, is uh, with Oxford University Press. It's called Assembling Life. And everything that you've heard tonight, or this evening, is in that book, right from the start to some of the uh, technical work we're doing trying to make DNA and make RNA. So that'll be coming out, that'll be fairly expensive though, because it's a so-called monograph. That's written for a technical uh, scientific audience. And then the, the uh, Scientific American is available right now.